Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Join us for a festival in Rochester that took place in and around a whole city block. Learn about a program in Austin that's turned graffiti into art. We pay a visit to historic Old Frontenac and take a ride in the sky from the airport in Albert Lee. It's all just ahead, off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Writers and potters, dancers and drummers, painters and jewelers all gathered in a one block area of downtown Rochester to share their art and engage the community in the first Rochester Art Blitz. The evening's events managed to sustain a laid back cohesion with its unified goal, self-expression and the cultivation of relationships between local artists and the broader community. You having a good time? Yeah, I'm having a great time. This is my grandma. Hello. Meet Grandma Peggy. It's one night, one city block, 30 performers, 30 plus visual artists. Creatives of all kinds, um, organizations and groups that are working on creative things that, that, that are going to help uh, push Rochester forward in a progressive direction. And it's everybody pretty much just coming together, showing the city what we have to work with, what we have in store that, you know, and, and muffle all the sounds of the people or the, or the reviews that say that Rochester is somewhat stagnant as far as arts and culture. So we're, we're here to make a statement, that's what Art Blitz is. Okay, the ultimate goal is, is to bring people together. Bring organizations, bring artists, bring uh, opportunities. With Art Blitz, I'm just trying to create one spot, one space, one night, where anyone who does want to come up with ideas or meet other people or, or might feel like lost, this is just the one place that they can meet and talk about talk about projects, talk about potential. And I want to make it to where it's a big enough ripple that people across the state or even across the country are, are asking themselves, like, what are they doing down there? You know, what's going on over there? What's that buzz about? You know, to where we get people's attention and let them know that we have a respectable scene. We're in downtown Rochester. Being in downtown Rochester is like being in the nerve center of things. You know, we're, we're right in the thick of it. So any, any statement or comment we want to make is going to be immediate, you know, and it, it's going to be there for the city immediately. We, we don't have to uh, try to move our way in from the outskirts or, or anything like that. We are dead center. Anything we're doing is going to be immediately felt. So. Downtown Rochester, it's the place to be, right? <laughs> Shall we take a walk? Let's do it. First stop, first stop, first stop. Cassandra Buck. Cassandra, tell them what you contributed to our Blitz. I helped organize the artists. All around this whole block, inside the alley, um, and some are inside some of the businesses, like Sante's and the Doggery. I'm personally in the Doggery, that's why I'm dressed up in my, my 20s garb. What are we doing today, Cassie? We are making history. <laughs> We're making history. All right. The location is really important. I mean, there's so many venues on this block, so many business owners that are, are really cool. This wouldn't be able to happen, as, you know, as cool as it is, if they weren't on board. And just the, just the general public being completely, completely down with it. A lot of, uh, a lot of venues and businesses and organizations offer to open their doors to 
add to the vibrancy of the show. This is Danielle Klicek uh, in front of Artistic Framers. Danielle, can you tell us a little bit about how you feel overall about the night and about Art Blitz in general from what you've heard? And I think it's great. It's a really good opportunity for everyone that wouldn't normally come down to an art event. Yeah, it's, it's Thank awesome. You. It's Thank fun. you for sharing your work. It covers the whole block too. Yes. Thank you yeah. for sharing your work. Yeah. Have a wonderful night. Yeah, over the last few years especially, the grassroots scene of arts and culture has really taken off. Before that, it was pretty much like groups or solo artists out in the woodwork and like thinking, well, they're, 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 I have no home here. There's no place I can call home. There's nowhere I feel comfortable. There's, there's no venue I feel comfortable in. And, and we all eventually came together. Right here, you have Bridget Skyhawk and you have Trevor James Sam. <laughs> You guys want to let us know how you feel about tonight? Uh, what do you think about the uh, the entire culmination of events like this? Well, and I just saw three pictures, so I it worked out for me. Today is a success. And we all realized that we wanted the same thing, and we, we found our home, and we made our home, and, and built this community within ourselves. And, and that's where we're at now. And now we know that we have power, and we have potential in numbers, and and we're using that to its utmost ability. And at the end of the day, what I wanted to, to stress to everyone was that there's no reason for stress, there's no Love reason. You, Love you! As a matter of fact, there's such a thing called positive stress, and this is what we have here. Yeah, as far as Art Blitz goes, I try to, one of the things I immediately try to do is share the passion and energy. Make it contagious, as contagious as possible. You know, I feel like a lot of the things that I do wouldn't be as successful if I, if I wasn't able to convey the sincere amount of passion that I have, you know, and, and just help people light fires within them. So that's what we're doing just on, on a mass scale, you know, I'm just sharing it and, and it's pretty much like, okay, get everyone and their passion and their interests and have them come share it with everyone as passionately as I do with my work. And let's just have a good time. In an effort to make the town more pleasant, the Austin City Parks and Rec Department utilized a clever plan. A graffiti task force program was formed to rid the city of gang signs and inappropriate graffiti by replacing it with fresher and more positive art. Many of Austin's residents were eager to help. There was some some travel stuff that I'd read. It was like advice for Japanese um, people that are touring in America. And one of the things it said is, if you're in a place with a lot of graffiti, that's a dangerous place. So if you go out and, and you know, you're in an area that's got a lot of vandalism and graffiti, some people get kind of scared by that. You know, they, they, they think that's not a safe place to, to be. Park and Rec, they have their graffiti miti mitigation. They, they go out and they have you know, their chemicals and scrubbers and power washers and all that. And they, and they do a pretty good job, but you know, they've got a lot of other things to do and city budgets only go so far. Park and Rec, a year or two ago, had kind of put out an invite to people to help and just scrub it. You know, help, come out, you know, we'll, we'll give you the chemicals and the brushes and come out and just help scrub it off. I believe they got zero volunteers. If you actually want people to come out and have fun doing it, you kind of have to let them run with it. The main problem with, with just whitewashing it or, or painting it brown again or whatever is you're just giving people a clean slate. And somebody comes along with, with a white spray paint and, and you're kind of back to where you were. We know we have a lot of talented people around and, and artists that are that are happy to lend their talents to, to volunteer stuff. So it just was another avenue for, for them to kind of express themselves and let them make their mark, I guess. We've kind of called it just the, the graffiti task force. And 
and we uh, certainly invite anybody that, that's interested. If they're kids, you know, they need, they need their adults with them. They get a form from the park and rec, they pick a spot that's had, had graffiti, and um, yeah, they can paint what they, what they want, whether that's words, you know, a positive message, or pictures, or, or it's really pretty much up to them, uh, and then they can go for it. And we try to avoid a lot of pre-approval and red tape and needing to submit your design because like those, the guys that are coming in and doing negative things, they're not really submitting designs and needing a lot of red tape, right? They just go out and do it. And so we're really trying to stick close to that. So there's not like a committee that approves of designs or anything like that and they can go paint what they want. But yeah, so it's really, you know, certainly all levels of artistic skill are, are invited to participate, you know, families and uh, church groups or whatever. It, it's, uh, we try to keep the bar pretty low and, um, and it's been a great response so far. People have been great. The, definitely the Park and Rec has been a, has been a big help. People can, can pretty much follow their own vision for what they, what they want to see up there. For us, it's really about just giving people a chance to have a positive impact on their own community. I've heard from people that had no idea what was going on and just saying, you know, yeah, I was walking around the, the pond or, or down, the, down the tunnel and wow, it, you know, it, just, it was just so fun to see it as opposed to walking around it and like, okay, hope your kid hasn't learned to read yet so you can explain to them what that word means, which, you know, this stuff might get um, marked up, but it's, I think it's not as rewarding for, for vandals because they want to have a nice big blank slate where they can put up their thing and, and have it just be the only thing up there. I guess people will have to judge for themselves if, if it's better to have it like this or better to have it with swear words and, and gang marks. I like it like this. It's fun to see that and and fun for, you know, for kids and, and families to be able to get out there, I think. It's up to every one of us to, to make the community what we want it to be. Frontenac was one of the first permanently settled communities in Minnesota. The picturesque scenery overlooking the Mississippi River soon began attracting wealthy residents. It became a community of summer homes with views of the river. Frontenac never outgrew its small town feel. It's a little community steeped in history. It's the little secret that most people don't know because it's not on the highway, it's not some place where most people would look to find a little village that's different than many villages. My name is Bill Webster and I live in the village of Old Frontenac. Frontenac is a village on the shore of Lake Pepin, which the Mississippi River runs through between the villages of Red Wing on the north and Lake City on the south. Frontenac today is a quaint little village. It hasn't changed. There are no street lights. We do have street signs, but the gravel roads and the grassy boulevards and the stone fence or lilac hedges, the older homes, the people that have come to Frontenac, still some of the same families that were originally here are still living at Frontenac. It's almost as if time has stopped. It's not really much different than uh, when it was a village a hundred years ago. The first voyager to arrive in this area was Father Hennepin in 1680 when he came down from Quebec. The French were attempting to beat the English to the midsection of what they thought was a great country and they would bring troops out here and build a fort. When Father Hennepin went back to report what 
he had seen said that in all of France's conquest, they had never seen the beauty that they saw in the area around Lake Pepin. Israel Garrard of the Garrard family from Cincinnati, Ohio, came out in order to go west with his brother to find uh, farming or ranching properties. Israel uh, had the background, a law background for, for one, and he also had a background in surveying because his grandfather surveyed the city of Cincinnati. Over a period of time, he built this village to build a, a tourist resort, but then to live here and raise his family. And that's what enticed his brothers to come out with him later, and also his stepbrother. Israel Garrard was a very generous person and uh, would invite people to come to Frontenac in the summertime to enjoy it, but realized that his house was not large enough. And so he took a grain elevator that was down on the point where the steamboats would land, and he moved it up higher into a little higher ground. And that became the first hotel and actually the first summer resort in Minnesota when it was called the Lakeside Hotel. And they could house up to 300 people, as many as 300 people with the hotel and the cottages. Well, Mark Twain uh, indicated that he stayed at the hotel, as did Ulysses S. Grant, and uh, quite a number of very prominent people, writers, poets. Mark Twain said that no beauty found elsewhere equals that of Lake Pepin. River traffic was the key to the establishment of all the commerce that eventually came to St. Paul and Minneapolis. So all the paddle wheelers would have to come through Lake Pepin. So the hotel itself was pulling people from a distance to stay for the summer and uh, it became known as a, a great summer resort and the place to be. One of the attractions for people coming from the east was that it resembled the Hudson River Valley, only the high precipitous bluffs on both sides of the river were about twice as high as those along the Hudson. General Garrard at one time had 27 horses and he encouraged other people to bring their horses because there was a racing track out by the railroad at uh, Front Neck Station. They also had uh, pigeon shooting in the park, and of course buggy rides and boat rides, sailboat races. It was a, uh, a full summer experience that uh, people enjoyed, and many of the people would rent one of the cottages for a month or two in the summertime, so whole families would come. Uh, and stay, they'd either come by the steamer, later they would come by the rail car. When the Civil War broke out, uh, the Garrard family felt that they should do something and fight for the North. Israel, Jephthah, Kenner, and Lewis, along with their mother, Sarah Bella Garrard McLean, met in Dr. Lewis's house. Mrs. Garrard decided that because Lewis had poor eyesight, and the fact that he was a doctor and also very good on the finances of the Garrard family business here, that he should stay home. So the other three went. Kenner went automatically because he had gone to West Point and was called in. Uh, Jephthah and Israel both formed companies. The three of those brothers, plus their stepbrother, Nathaniel McLean, all fought in battles throughout the Civil War. None of them were injured. They all came back to Frontenac and had homes here for a while. But the little village of Frontenac had, at one time, had four generals uh, from the Civil War. When Israel brought his wife to Frontenac, they soon had two children. And she became expecting a third. And unfortunately, in 1869, she passed away. She was buried in what is called the Garrard Circle, which is at the far end of the cemetery. Garrard Avenue is eight blocks long. Of the houses on Garrard Avenue, several of them were built in the 1850s. Starting on the north is Dr. Lewis Garrard's house called Dakota Cottage. 
The next house is Winona Cottage, and that was built by Israel as a wedding present for his son, George Woodgerard. And that was built in 1878. The house south of George Woodgerard's is Israel Gerard's, and that was built in 1854. I am the third William B. Webster to live in the same house, preceded by my father and my grandfather. It was built in 1858 for the mother of the four Gerard brothers. Sarah Bella Gerard married John McLean, who was the Postmaster General at one time, and then on the U.S. Supreme Court. At the time of the Dred Scott decision, Again, we're asked often about the longevity. You know, why do people stay? Why do second and third generation people come back to Frontenac? And I think, it's, again, it's just the, uh, the pace of life. Frontenac is now surrounded by this Frontenac State Park, so it can't grow. In the 1870s, the railroad was coming up the Mississippi River, General Garrard decided that he wouldn't allow them to come through the land. And that's why the railroad is two miles offshore, where the rest of the railroad is all along the river, all the way to St. Paul. In the 1970s, Frontenac was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Not only the individual houses that are here, but the whole community. I think I could find happiness almost anywhere, but when I wake up in the morning and look out over Lake Pepin at any season, I feel blessed. Gliders are different from other forms of air travel because they are very quiet. There are no humming engines, just the whisper of the wind on the wings. We made a trip to the Albert Lee Airport and got to ride in one of these elegant yet simple machines. It's what we call a glider regatta, and the difference between this and a contest on it, this is just for fun. We started doing this about 25 years ago, and someone woke up and says, you know, it's been 25 years, we should do this again, just because it's fun. Most of these people are from around Minnesota, and some of them Wisconsin, a few from Iowa. When we have the glider contests out here, we uh, get people from all over the world. We hold the U.S. nationals here, and we've held six of the seven classes of gliders uh, competitions in the, the country. Gliders are fun to fly on it because, you, one, you don't have to manage the engine, and the second thing is because it's a challenge to fly it and fly it accurately and correctly. You literally, you stay in the sky or you don't, depending on your skill, your ability to find thermals, rising columns of air, and to navigate them, to exploit them, to gain altitude, and then go on to the next one. So it's a, a bit of a chess game. Many people think that gliding is difficult, and it's, really it is, it's difficult in that you have to be able to navigate and find uh, un unseen thermals and these kinds of things. But on the other hand, gliders are very simple to fly. You look at most of these gliders, they'll stall at 28 to 30 miles an hour. It's, they're very, very slow flying aircraft on it when you need to. They'll cruise at over 100, but they're built to be landed out in fields if, uh, if required. Gliding is a very inexpensive sport, relatively inexpensive uh, aerial sport. When you look at it, you will have some of these glider trailers over here. You don't have to pay hangar rent. The aircraft lives in the trailer. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to assemble. 
And uh, beyond that, it, all it takes is either a winch launch or an arrow tow to get uh, aloft on it. If you've got a good day like today on it, you can stay aloft for hours. So it's very inexpensive flying if that's uh, what uh, you're looking for. And it takes a while to get the grin off your face. And you're guaranteed to go home with no adrenaline whatsoever because uh, it'll ring you out really good. And you'll also notice that you, people over here help each other. And that's one of the nice things I like about gliding. It's a very social sport. People, you can't go gliding by yourself. You need someone to, to be the tow pilot. You need someone to help you rig. You may need someone to help you walk the wing. So people get to interact with each other. And that's why gliding is one of the, the air sports that is actually increasing the number of pilots as compared to other forms of aerial transportation. That's all for this episode. Please help keep Off 90 on the air with more great stories by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.